This 65-year-old man with an intermittent cataract and the Rexus has run off to the equator. This video is not about the reasons for the Argentinian flag sign rather than what to do once we have it. Should I fake o or should I convert? Now let me get this point very clear now. There is no harm or shame in converting to manual SICS or ACC in such a situation. The decision to continue with FACO or to convert should be based on these following factors. Skill level and experience of the surgeon, density of the nucleus, how good is the visibility, the amount of pupillary dilatation and the corneal clarity. And lastly, presence of coexisting pathologies like the status of the corneal endothelial health, pseudo exfoliation, etc. Coming to this case, the nucleus is not soft but it's about grade 3 and does not appear to be very hard. I think it's manageable. The pupil is extremely well dilated and the cornea is quite clear, so visibility is not an issue. Well, I have been in this situation many times in the past and I am backing myself to meet the challenge in the event of any intraoperative difficulty. Well, I have decided to continue with phaco emulsification in this case. And let's see how things go. Before I start, let's understand with this present situation what can go wrong in the worst case scenario? The extended anterior tear can extend posteriorly beyond the equator and can cause PC tear which if undetected can result in nucleus drop. The goal is to prevent the tear from extending onto the posterior capsule. And the golden principle to achieve this goal are number one, Maintain chamber equilibrium at every step of the surgery. Minimize stress on the torn edges of the anterior capsule and abort phaco if situation worsens. Let's get in live. The first thing I need to do is to enlarge the capsular opening. But before I do that, I need to decompress the bag. Carefully and slowly, the swollen cortex is gently aspirated from underneath the anterior capsular flaps. Before switching hands, OVD is injected to prevent shelling of the anterior chamber. The OVD is injected above the anterior capsule. If we inject here, that is in the opening below the anterior capsule, the chances are the tear can extend posterior to the equator. Using a micro scissors, a tangential cut is given to the anterior capsule and I'm using a forceps to trim the capsule. The same procedure is repeated on the other side. I didn't want to make a very big opening, but this is slightly smaller than what I would have liked. I have chosen to perform stop and chop technique for nucleus management in this case. While sculpting, I'm very careful that I don't exert any stress on the bag. I'm using good amount of phaco energy to ensure that I don't push at the nucleus. I'm also aware that I cannot rotate the nucleus before creating some space. I thought the trench was deep enough and I'm trying to do lateral separation carefully. The posterior plate in the inferior half is separated but the subincisional half of the pussy plate is not separated. I am skeptical to use any more force. I thought I will chop and take out one piece which would create more space in the bag and then would be less stressful in the bag during further nucleus manipulation. And then go and emulsify the two free pieces. Each of these pieces are pulled out of the bag and emulsified in the supracapsular region. The chamber is refilled with OVD. Since the bag is empty, the nucleus rotation is less stressful to the bag now. The hemineucleus is then chopped into two fragments. Then one of the fragment is pulled out of the bag. Now in this situation, I need to be extremely careful not to have lens chatter because the endothelium is quite close here. So reducing the amount of lens chatter is going to be invaluable in minimizing the endothelial trauma. The remaining fragment is emulsified in a controlled manner. There is no cortex to aspirate. 
The bag is formed with OVD and the lens is implanted. So now we have a situation where the rexis is not continuous and so how do we go about now? The first thing I do is to enlarge rexis by snipping at the margin in the other quadrant uh, in the form of a tangential cut so that I can enlarge the rexis using a micro forceps. Uh, in this case, I have decided to go ahead with the phaco emulsification. The pupil is well dilated. The nucleus is not soft though, but the good thing is that the edge of the tone and theory capsule is very well visualized and is currently averted and fluttering, which is a good sign. The principle of no hydro dissection and minimal rotation of the nucleus will be followed. With one eye on the flap, I begin phaco emulsification of the nucleus. Before performing the first vertical chop, I am creating a small trench by sculpting the central part of the nucleus. The idea is to get a good purchase of the central core of the nucleus. The first chop is done and as I am laterally separating the fragments, I am conscious to be very gentle with my lateral separation maneuvers. The idea is to prevent any stress on the tone edge of the endocapsule. The second chop is done now and I have a free fragment which I pulled out of the bag and then I am emulsifying it. The emulsification of the quadrant is being done in the antechamber and completed. Now the nucleus is rotated gently and the subsequent vertical chops are done to divide the hemi-nucleus into two more smaller fragments. These two fragments are being emulsified in a controlled manner. As can be clearly seen here, the plane of emulsification is much more anterior than what I would have liked but the circumstances are such that emulsifying it in a much more anterior plane is a safer option. Before coming out, I inject OVD through the side port to prevent any shallowing of the antechamber. Now we want to maintain the anterior chamber equilibrium at every step of the surgery. That's very critical in such situations. The second hemineucleus is then divided into smaller fragments and then each of them is emulsified in a controlled manner. OVD is again injected through the side port before coming out. There is very little cortex which is then aspirated out. The OVD both in front and behind the lens is irrigated out. It's ensured that the haptics are away from the area of the tone rexus before closing. That's it, the case is done. And this is a picture on the first post-op day. So to summarize, a discontinuous rexus creates a weak area in the anterior capsule opening and it carries a risk of a wraparound tear extending to the posterior capsule during nucleus manipulation and carries a high risk of nucleus dropping into the vitreous. Now if I decide to continue with FACO, uh, here are the seven principles I would like to follow. The first thing I would like to do always is to enlarge the other quadrant of the rexus, especially if the capsular opening is very small to begin with. By enlarging the capsular opening, uh, it will ensure lesser stress on the bag during nucleus manipulation, especially during division of the nucleus. Typically, I avoid hydrodissection and minimize nucleus rotation in eyes which have a discontinuous rexus. The third most important principle is to ensure that the chamber equilibrium is maintained at every moment of the surgery. This is probably one of the most critical aspects because sudden shallowing or sudden deepening of the chamber is going to extend the torn edge of the anterior capsule beyond the equator and into the posterior capsule. While performing a phaco emulsification, I ensure that I keep a close watch on the tone flap at every moment of the surgery. If the flap is mobile, fluttering and everted, then it's all good. This is the flap motility sign. However, if the flap is stiff, inverted and not moving at all, then it is not a good sign. It's indicative of an, the tear having extended beyond the equator into the posterior capsule. During nucleus chopping maneuvers, lateral separation has to be very gentle 
to minimize any stress on the torn edge of the anti capsule. After the first chop is done and the first fragment is created, invariably I pull it out of the bag and emulsify it first. This helps in creating space within the bag which ensures that there is lesser stress on the weak capsular margin. And finally, the fragment emulsification is done in the anterior chamber above the anticapsular plane. Hence, it becomes mandatory for us to protect the endothelium by using adequate amount of good dispersive OVD. So these are the seven principles which I try to follow when I'm performing fake emulsification in an eye with an incomplete rexus.